Irina Shatalova. I have known her for many years now. It's been a pleasure. She's a magnificent camera person, I can assure you. She made a film together with her director, Nastya, called Lina, which I love. And um, now she's talking about something which hasn't got to, to the making of films, but showing films. So please, Irina, Docker Project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure for me to be at this conference. It's already the second day of the conference, and I want to say that we have a lot in common. We're talking about the same thing, all of us. We're talking about creative documentary, it's not a television film. And all the projects that we were talking about earlier, they have something in common. And there's something in common even with the Docker and Doc Lounge. The difference, the big difference between our two projects is the following. Uh, we didn't have the support to begin with, the Docker project. So, um, officially, I'm talking about uh, the name of the report is from the Regional Film Club to the International Film Festival. When we started screenings, we had nothing, zero. We started from scratch, we had no support. And now the situation changed, but it didn't change completely. We can talk about coming out to the new level, or at least that there's um, there's no loss, even though there is no profit sometimes. Our project started in the year um, 2011, thanks to a very favorable incident, like a lot of the times in the documentary industry. You just have to be ready to accept. There was a small bunch of people that were studying together, the cameramen, directors, um, sound directors, my colleagues. We met a lot of times, a lot of times just in the apartments, in the kitchens, and we were discussing the problems of the documentary film industry, and everything was come down to the fact that in 2008, 2009, 2010, at least in Moscow, if we talk about regional project, we didn't have an opportunity to have uh, regular meetings, regular screenings. We had no venue where, for example, we could have a premiere. Mm -hmm. There were famous festivals like Flartiana and Message to Men, but there was no venue where we could, on a regular basis, come and exchange the energy as professionals. We had a white hall of the house of the cinema. The projection there is horrible, but also I mean, it was really, really hard to be there, really hard to screen there. I mean, we didn't like the place. And we couldn't understand their programming either of this house of cinema in Moscow. But we did have our dream to create a special venue where we can exchange the energy, for, um, the Russian documentary specialists could exchange energy. And before that we were meeting in the cafe, so we had an idea, maybe we have our own cafe and screen there, but then we rejected the idea, we tried a couple of times and then we understood that no, this is not what we want. Because there are a lot of people having fun, drinking, I know it's not something that we needed. We needed something more serious. Hmm? So at the beginning of the year 2011, the head of the movie theater Donjou uh, called us and they have a very nice venue because it's a mansion in the center of Moscow, not too far away from Kremlin. And they had two very nice um, venues 
for like 110, um, each for 110 seats. Um, the problem was that the heads of this movie theater, they wanted to create an audience, so they reached out asking for screenings or events to attract people and especially young people to those two halls, projection halls that they had. And it was only enthusiasm, they were not planning to pay us. What they wanted is people to come for free and we had to organize the events for free. So that's why they couldn't find anybody except for us because we needed the venue. And we did not really care for money at the time. This is how it all started. We started to organize screening every week, every Tuesday, in that donjou. It started with using social networks, of course. We have a social network called Vkontakte, that is Russian analog of Facebook. And very quickly, we found the audience that wanted to watch the movies. Um, the first screening was um, done by the... Uh, we attracted the audience by the SMS writing to our friends. And this is our third screening, the photo from there. So it's quite a lot of people. So in order to get all those viewers that didn't manage to fit in the in the room that would host 70, 70 people sitting. And we did all that using our energy. We didn't use the money, we didn't need anything. It was just the correct energy. And there was a demand then from the audience for this. So after they organized this screening, and not everybody managed to watch the film, we put the TV screens in the, in the hallways and we screened the film there so people could watch it because there were a lot of people wanting to come in. Then we were given the big hall that could seat 110 people, but then by the fifth screening there was still more audience wanted to watch that than there were available seating. Um, so we started to create our database for the viewers, the audience who was interested in the documentary films. I shouldn't explain to you guys that every documentary film is connected to some area in life. So the topic of the movie would attract different audiences. Every time we had the same audience, but there were also the newcomers. And some of those newcomers would come again and again and again to watch the documentary films that we were screening. I missed something that I wanted to tell you. And the film is in, the text is in English, so I'm just going to dub it in Russian. We didn't want to create a manifesto, something strict and hard for our project. We wanted this project to develop and to be flexible. We wanted to be able to show all different kinds of movies, but we formulated principles and parameters of the films that we wanted to, to screen. And those principles were not like the most rigid ones, but but this is what we wanted, what we wanted to show, what we wanted to make an accent on. So the word combination documentary movie stress falls on the movie. There are millions of ways to make a documentary, but one thing should stay intact, and that is drama and the interest. And then image and sound are important for the dogs as much as for the fiction film. Because the language of the cinema is made up of sounds and images. So overall, that's how it was. It's and we try to follow those principles. Why did people want to watch the films? The demand is a demand, but the demand cannot be forever. And friends in the social networks cannot come every Tuesday just because you're friends. The fact that the interest was always up, we explain the following way. 
we were preparing every screening as a separate story, as a separate program. Um, our goal is a Russian film, the Russian documentary film. And it was harder, by the way, to work with the um, foreign films, especially for us as newcomers. The problem was the following. A lo the majority of the Russian films did, were not packed the right way, so to say, especially in the year 2011. For example, the film didn't have the logline, didn't have the synopsis. The filmmakers came with beautiful films, but when we asked them to write a synopsis, they gave us like one sentence starting with our film tells the story, and then it will end with uh, question marks, for example. And then, of course, the, um, the audience, why would the audience spend an hour and a half for watching this film that has such a horrible synopsis? Besides, the films didn't have posters. About 50% of all the movies didn't have the trailers. And also, some of the movies had really bad quality. And it was all raw material. We were happy to experiment. We found time to work with every film. So what you see is just a few seasons that we organized. We worked very hard with every film. We tried to make the packaging, the wrapping. And we couldn't pay to the um, director, to the filmmakers, but we gave it to them, everything, that, all the package that we created after our work. And then the director and then the producer could use our posters later on in promoting the film. What was very important for us is working in the social networks. First, as I said, was in Vkontakte, then people moved to Facebook. What was important for us was to have a feedback from the audience. It was important for us to answer every comment, every question from the audience, even when it was not the best question. We were happy to have any kind of feedback. So, each screening had the photo report in the end, and then the minutes of the discussions, because I think discussions is a very important thing for screening. About like half a year after this activity, oh, sorry, I forgot to tell you something, that we didn't have a plan as a working plan. We were just working and we were ready that we could be shut down any time. But then, no, we still continue working. So, um, half a year afterwards, regional venues start contacting us. For example, in Krasnoyarsk in Siberia, the first um, photo and the second photo is in St. Petersburg. That's a venue called Katim. Then uh, venues from Yekaterinburg and Yaroslavl and Nizhny Novgorod, the Russian towns who are contacting us. Not all of the venues stayed with us. They worked with us a little bit and then that's it. For example, in St. Petersburg, we were screening for half a year in Vladikavkaz for a year. And this is the photo of one of our venues that is the most active one. They have their own audience. The only thing they needed is of course the program, of course the material and some sort of workshop from us to teach them how to do it, how to organize, how to get the audience. Then little by little, the regional venues, our Don Jour, for example, um, they, they said, okay, we get the audience, and then, so we have to sell the tickets for the screening. But it was like really basic, it was minimal, so it was not a lot. We didn't want any percentage from the ticket sales, and I mean, we were not a legal entity, and we were also afraid to scare the audience that we got. Yes, we know that a lot of people come to our screenings because it's for free. But nevertheless, the venue started working on their own, they printed posters, they charged money for tickets. There was a lot of research studying the audience, 
And it was quite important for us because as a documentary makers, promoters, we wanted to understand who is coming to watch the screenings. For example, if you have like only 40 people for zero, we still want to know who they are, where they come from, whether it's the first time they come to us or not. And that's the stats that we really need and appreciate, and we get quite a lot of it by the years of working. This way we understand who is our audience, whether they're ready to pay for the documentary films. So the first one, the picture is like um, red one with no, and the blue one with yes, we're ready to pay for the documentary films. Here, this is from social networks. The first line is men, then women, and then the age. The main target audience is, of course, 25, 34 years old. And I must say that this is the picture now in Russia. We didn't want to stop. We didn't want to stop with the things that we reached, that is the screenings and discussions we want to develop. And we, know, we always called ourselves a project. So we went to the development. We organized master classes as part of this development. This is the director who was showing his film first, and then about for three hours he was conducting a master class. And there were so-called secret screenings before the opening night. This is Alina Palunina presenting her film Nepal Forever a year before the official opening night at the Roman Film Festival. So of course we didn't we didn't sell any tickets. This was just the screening, but it was very important for the director. It was her initiative to have the screening, and she turned to us. A lot of authors like to have the opening nights on our venue, so they turned to us. What was important for them is to make a screening and a discussion, to have a feedback after the screening. And it was really their own audience, so we were very interested too. Later on, what happened was cooperation with cinematic organizations and cultural organizations. We collaborated a lot with the Goethe Institute in programming and bringing the authors from Germany. We worked with Russian film festivals. So that's very logical. That these are very logical steps. There's no economic model, but it's just cool to do it. And then we tried theatrical distribution at the beginning of 2014. We were a company, the, pro the Docker project by then, so we were quite legal. And this, I'm a producer of this film. We released this film. So we used all the audience, the database that we created as a Docker. So in winter, right after the New Year's, we released this documentary film. It's a rather complex film from a national point of view, especially. We had 10 screenings, and we're very happy with the result. But we didn't have any money for advertising. But anyway, we succeeded, and we even got some profit from those 10 screenings. And the audience came even to the last screening, which I think is important. I'm going to talk about how Docker became a film festival and why that happened. We always wanted to show not just the Russian films. And that was the starting point for the festival, the reason we created the festival. If we turn back in the past a little bit, I first was in the International Film Festival in Dok Leipzig. I was so shocked when I was at that festival in Leipzig that up to the point till we created the film festival Docker, the shock didn't go away. I studied in Vgik. Then I was very interested in the movies and I was traveling from one Russian festival to another Russian festival. I was watching some classic films. As yesterday, the selector for the message to men said, you can find it in Rue Tracker. Hmm? 
But when I looked at the program of the contemporary festivals, you know, I see that they're in the tracker. You know, all the program is there, I can watch. But I was so shocked. I couldn't understand that the documentary films could be as they are, even though I was interested in the documentary films before. So this is my area of interest. Some of the foreign films um, I didn't watch in Russia before, before Leipzig. So I came to the thought that we as an audience in Russia, uh, we are deprived of something. So starting from 2008, an idea was born in my head that we have to do something similar in Moscow, showing the foreign documentary films. And there was nothing in Moscow that would show independent documentary films. So there were, there is a festival in Moscow that's showing documentary films, but these are the hits. Um, those who are winners in the film festivals. But then we lose the independent uh, documentary films. So this idea I always had in my brain and I really wanted to put it to life. So by the year 2014, it became a very serious, um, very serious idea. We were happy to organize this project. We started visiting the festivals and talking seriously with the distributors and with the producers about programming. And in a test mode, we gave the information about the new coming festival, our own festival. And we put some um, famous films there, quite well-known films there. And then we got about 100 um, applications for the festival. We didn't charge for the applications, it was for free. When we started to read those applications to see you know, what, which films they sent to us, we understood that there were some really pearls, diamonds, that we really want to show now and what's going to happen next if we have the application period for the whole year. So it was very clear for us that we have to organize a festival. So in 2015, we opened the Docker Film Festival. You have to understand that we never stopped working. It was a big project that gained the energy, gained the power, gained the scope. The most important event happened in May of 2015. There were 40 films from 32 countries from all the continents in the world. We didn't have financing, of course, for the festival. We made various steps to get the financing. We knocked on the door of Ministry of Culture to the government administration of the city of Moscow. We tried to find the sponsors, but we didn't have enough experience. So everybody we asked, and those were bureaucrats, they asked us the same question. They were saying, who is behind you? Who is standing behind you guys? And when, when we said, well, we have the audience behind us, and they were laughing at us, those bureaucrats were saying, well, then come next time, please. So everybody loved the idea that we had but they didn't understand why we're asking for money. So we decided not to think too much about the Ministry of Culture and the other bureaucrats, and we decided to organize this festival, whatever, whatever happens. But we didn't have financing, and we wanted the festival, and we wanted it to look like other festivals. So we took our own money, we paid for, um, we paid for the um, movie theater, we didn't charge the audience for the entrance for five days. We announced the event very well. Um, at the entrance we had a big charity box where people just could put money in and the volunteers of the festival cooked the cookies and then were treating the audience with the homemade cookies. Well, it was a really neat event. We also turned to very respectable people in the world of documentary cinema. And here's the a slide with the photographs. You can see a tour here and Kosakovsky and other directors from Russia but also film critics and cameramen for other countries, we turned to them to uh, write about our program without coming to Russia. 
so we were very shrewd. We understand it's not really nice to do that, but that's the only way we could use to give the official status to our event. So we did everything in order to show those beautiful people the films that we received. So in the end, I don't know how to say that, but there was an online jury. So the jury in the end watched all the programs, short and full length, then they were talking, communicating, arguing via Skype and gave their verdicts. Why was it so important for us? Because we wanted to understand how competitive our program was. And after this event, we understood that perhaps we are great, we are on the track. Because the program was really appreciated and evaluated well. Mm? But we were really in depth. Because we were very sorry that such a beautiful jury got the prize winners. But some people even came to visit us. This is Sophie Turkevich from Australia, an author from Great Britain. But we had very few people who we managed to invite. So we helped them in a very little way, I must say. Because we didn't have any official means to bring them to Russia. Well, the audience, we had a huge audience, everybody was very happy. And we could understand, we understand that we are in debt. So at least the award winners of our first festival we have to bring to Moscow. So we started the crowdfunding. And because we needed to bring the award winners and make the second um, round of the festival. And then everybody just became crazy in a positive way. Our audience started buying the presents. We had the hashtag that the documentary will save the world. Marina Razbeshkina gave us a right to make such a wonderful pillow, as you see on the screen, that says the dreams of Marina Razbeshkina. And that was very inspiring and empowering for us. It was a lot of fun when we were doing the crowdfunding. So in the end, we were happy, the audience was happy, and we were on that so-called drive. It all worked well. We didn't ask for too much money, but it was important for us to create the activity. We also turned to various experts so that the experts would watch the award-winning films and would give their expert opinion and that expert opinion would perhaps attract some other audience and perhaps would attract the sponsors. Can I have three minutes for the trailer, please? To show the expert opinion. I just want to show you with a composer, Piotr Nalic, who watched the film connected to identity in Peru how the people in Peru are looking, searching for themselves. I want to say that it's very, very important. We asked the expert to give us very simple opinion so we could understand them. I think there are subtitles, if I'm not mistaken. Чуть-чуть сюжета там есть, то есть люди как бы они собираются в разных местах, и приходят на этот фестиваль, 
прежде всего сопряжено с чудесной природой, сопряжено с всякими переживаниями и мыслями вообще о жизни этих замечательных людей, разных. Где-то в горах более этническая музыка, ближе к в Лиме она более такая классическая, латиноамериканская. Все это вместе соединяется, все это чудесно, восхитительно, очень интересно. постепенно вырастает, и сопр... еще сейчас сопрягается с африканским элементом, который принесен туда чернокожими а, ребятами, и то, как они там отбивают всякие эти свои а, кафоны и бубны тарелки, это совершенно чудесно, и как это все сочетается с индийской культурой, а, потом и с латиноамериканской, которая уже как бы над этим уже из этого сама выросла, то есть именно такая вот городская тангообразная, скажем так. Но все это вместе, конечно, удивительный питательный бульон, на котором, я думаю, все музыканты будут рады его попить и вкупаться в нем, не знаю, что с ним будет делать. Я очень рад, что такой фильм в Москве смогут увидеть много-много людей. Это здорово, по-моему. Ну, вот э, вполне логично. It's rather logical scheme. If you have an expert, we have the crowdfunding campaign. We would like the idea in general of asking various people about our programming, about the documentary films that we're screening. And then what we really liked, people that, um, that we liked, like Konchalovsky, for example, and other great people who come and discuss the documentary films. And also it was very important, when we were really desperate, we would come to those nice famous people and they would kind of cheer us up and add the enthusiasm that we were losing. And again, we could understand over and over why we're doing what we're doing. So, the second round worked. We had the authors of the films, we had some of the actresses coming to Moscow. We had enough money to do the project, we were not in debt anymore, we didn't take any credits. It was a very important event, so here are some of the photos of that event. We already had a different movie theater because it was bigger than the first venue in Moscow that we had. So I think that we were on some sort of mission then. Now, I would like to talk about the festival of the year 2016. It was not a long time ago when it happened. We already had the models. We already understood that we cannot do things for free. So in advance, we were looking for financing. But the experience that we had beforehand was really helpful especially the expert opinions that influence the, um, what the sponsor thinks. And it was easier for us to persuade the sponsors using the famous people. We thought that's kind of a neat tool that works. So we, had the, we got the budget for the festival, not the biggest budget, but it was enough. We knew that we could pay the jury. We knew that we could at least pay the way for the creators of the film. But we also used a lot of wonderful volunteers. This is the photograph of the even bigger movie theater called October in Moscow that we used for the festival in 2016 that had, had a wonderful venue, open air venue besides the movie halls. We also had the theater of Yermolova, another venue for our events for that framework of that festival in 2016. The festival was running for six days. Do I have time more to talk? Or 
Okay, then just for you to have the full picture, to have a full understanding of the program this year, I want to show you a little trailer. That's our jury for 2016. And that was um, um, the author of the film Three Rooms of the Melancholy, the producer from um, Great Britain and from Russia. We also have jury for the short films and for the new competition, Let It Talk competition. Um, IT company was one of our sponsors, that's why we had this competition, because we thought that would be very nice. And we think that we were right, we liked that competition. Let me show you the trailer of the main competition of the 2016. So you can see that besides the main sponsor, we had the cultural venues that helped us, and that is Goethe Institute that helped us to bring the German author. Canadian Embassy helped us to bring Canadian author. And that was very helpful because we had quite a big festival in the end. So this is the way in one slide from the 70 um, people room to the bigger room. We needed five years for that. Of course, we economically we didn't create any model, but we're happy that we managed to create a festival. And now we will organize the screening maybe not um, every week. We will also try to pay the authors. We will try. We will start charging for tickets because we're not the film club anymore, as we developed. And I think that's very logical development. And it's very important to work in the social networks, I want to mention. We need to be au courant what's happening. These are the last news of the Message to Men Festival. These are our fans there. Uh, we can tell that there are um, 6,785 fans of the Docker project. But every person of those 6,785 viewers and fans was present in our screening, and that's very important for us. That's a map that we had after the May festival, after different events that we organized in Russia, and you see those film events, so the film week or the festival where we were invited as, a, as representing the program or as curators. So our team was in all those spots that you see on the, um, on the map, those beautiful towns, and is an ambassador for the name of Docker. I think that's briefly it, what I wanted to tell you today, but the history of our project. These are the resources that you can use in the contacts. I also want to say, we were talking a lot of the times yesterday about the platforms. We also try to do the internet platform, of course, in the test mode. We didn't, we were not pretentious. But this is what we created, 
a Docker project online. This is the analog in Russian. I mean, the format of the screen is not convenient. That's a problem now, but it's only now. There are seven or eight films that you can watch on VOD, in VOD. We prepared all those films. The filmmakers had an idea to put their films on video on demand, but since we didn't have the money for advertising, it may look a little bit funny. Maybe like once a month somebody would watch the film. But I think Russian documentary makers perhaps remember the story of a movie that was prohibited by the Ministry of Culture. And the director, Alona, asked us to make this screening for money online. Now you can watch it for free. But before that, this film, Varia, cost $2 to watch. And thanks to the scandal that Ministry of Culture organized, the director of the film managed to make some money, actually, having the uh, paid screening. So he, the profit was like around 400 euros. It's not much, but it's something. And we were helping the author of the film to get them. Thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, it's probably it's amazing. So now it started like a kind of kamikaze project, huh? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. But now it's more stable. I'm just worried about you and your. No, you're very worried. Yes, you ha you have the right to be worried. Because we don't have any system, we don't have any stable base. Um, uh, we just started to uh, protect ourselves against risks. We're not going to behave like kamikazes. Uh, we'll be trying to uh, be a bit more sensible in our approach. I just want to say one thing. What, what, really, what I really like to be in the jury the first time, I don't know if you do that, uh, also in, in 2016 was that it was not the best film is, it was also a prize for the best camera boy, camera person, the best editor, the best music, the best sound engineering, etc. I found that very, very nice because it's, uh, you know, also to, to uh, pay a tribute to, to, to the team behind films. Are you doing that still? Yes, we, uh, it was very important for us to follow this principle and to identify the different professions and to recognize their contribution to dogs. Uh, this is um, not commonly done uh, when, say, the, uh, the um, sound engineers are awarded, but this is highly important to us. And this is because you are, the people who are making the festival are filmmakers, yes? No, for all yes. And if you should say something about the, prof uh, policy, the, the, the programming policy of your festival compared to the other festivals which are more established also in, in Europe, what, what would you, how would you characterize it? Uh, it's difficult for me to judge because there isn't a common, um, there isn't a single direction. Uh, maybe it will sound stupid, but when we were thinking what kind of program we're going to have, uh, the festival team, which is about 10 people uh, that take part in the selection, we agreed that we wouldn't be limited by, by the topic, by the subject, we wouldn't be limited by, the, by geography, and we wouldn't be limited by the genre. Because clearly, um, Documentary filmmakers um, have their own tastes and preferences. Some don't like, say, reenactments, reconstructions. But but we don't uh, uh, we don't we don't limit ourselves to a particular type of um, of documentaries. We wanted to give our views the whole palette of independent documentary um, films. 
So um, the films uh, come either directly through creators or through uh, small distributors. Uh, for example, we had Staskovsky Films um, uh, at this festival and a number of other um, companies. But more often than not, we work directly with independent uh, auteurs, especially what comes to regions like Latin America, Asia, or Africa. The first year, you know, 40 films from 32 countries, so there's also a kind of a global view. You want to cover as many countries as possible, or how? <laughs> how is that? No, нет, конечно, нет такого прям вот подхода, чтобы охватить все все страны, но. Um, well, um, basically, uh, we didn't have, we didn't attempt to uh, cover all the countries. But um, if um, there are many films coming from one of the same country, um, we're probably going to um, cast some of them out, uh, so that we could present uh, films from other regions as well. And you still want to have 40 films, or do you want to increase, or, or what? Uh, well, we want to grow, but everything is going to depend on the um, budget because we um, only just started uh, raising our funds for the next festival. Because if you compare with other festivals like Leipzig, Itfa, etc., I mean, they have 200, 300 films and so on. Yes, but we don't have such ambitions, and we don't have such opportunity. Uh, we don't have such opportunities. We like to have it consecutive, from film clubs to project to project to festival. Um, uh, we don't want to be under any pressure. We don't want to uh, violate anybody's uh, intentions or behavior. Any more? Any questions? No, it's only me. Yeah, please. Irina, I've got a question about how you work with the regions. I've been following your project for a long time. Uh, one thing I can't understand is how you work with your regional venues, because uh, do they start uh, working under your brand uh, and are mini dokers in the uh, regions, or do you work with them from time to time? Is that a one-off, one-on um, mechanism, and they follow their own agenda in their free time? Well, um, they are DOCA representatives. Initially, when there is an initiative emerging, we explain how we work, we explain, uh, explain the regulations, and we explain that it's highly important for us to have a single curator. Uh, who would be responsible for the screenings, who would be motivated uh, to do that, and who wouldn't be likely to dump the whole thing after two weeks of work. And uh, we uh, we carry out the testing, and we um, even uh, visit our venues uh, in other cities so that we uh, see that to check that we're not cheated on, and we keep, um, uh, keep our hand uh, on the pulse uh, we uh, carefully monitor what is happening uh, with uh, different venues and um, uh, in Yaroslavl, for example, um, there is one Doka venue uh, and they organize, um, they organize events uh, and they think which speakers to invite, uh, they liaise with uh, directors and sometimes even pay their fares to Yaroslavl, pay for their tickets to get to Yaroslavl. Um, so, um, uh, this venue cannot go about showing whatever they care to show. They have to follow our agenda. Okay, I would like to have uh, a from the critic here, the very critical man yesterday, also wonderful. But you, you, you know, probably a lot of festivals here, documentary festivals in Russia. What about this one? How do you look upon that? Thank you, Tuya. Uh, okay, uh, in Russia, festivals generally, uh, well, uh, there, uh, there are several dozens of them, and they're all different from the romantic uh, Soviet type ones to uh, very, very corrupt. Uh, but uh, given uh, Irina's pedantic approach and her um, love of being um, consecutive and consistent, 
Um, of course, uh, I could criticize a lot of things here, and uh, I could uh, say that it's an enthusiastic initiative, but um, a very unprofessional one. Uh, I wouldn't do that. I would describe it as very impulsive, grassroots initiative that follows a, sm a snowball mechanism, uh, keeps growing. So, um, and it's nice to look at Irina. It's nice to see that she loves um, uh, doing what she is doing, and uh, we all can feel it. Thank you. Uh, it's very uh, good to know because um, Anton has uh, has been 